Welcome to the second video on the MIT Integration B2022 Qualifying Round. In this video, we'll be covering even more interesting questions. So without further ado, let us take a look at problem number 11. So for this problem, we have an infinite string of nested signs. So if you'd like to give this question a go, feel free to pause the video now. Okay, the solution for this question is a bit difficult to explain, but I try my best. So uh, to understand the li limiting behavior of all these signs, uh, we need to draw a bit of diagram. So, so this technique might be familiar to some of you, but may be less familiar to others. So let me just very quickly illustrate uh, how to think about uh, nested functions. So let's say we have a curve here, uh, just for illustration purpose, let's say this is y equals fx, and this is the line y equals x. Okay, so if we pick a value, uh, a, right, this uh, dotted line here, will back on, onto the graph y equals fx, obviously this is the value fa, right? Now, how do we show f of f of a on this graph? What we do is if we draw the f a line horizontally, this value that you captured uh, on the y equals x line, right, will give you x equals f a here. So now if we move vertically along the f a vertical line back to the y equals f x line, the point that we get would be f of f of a. So hopefully that is clear because this is the basic premise. Uh, so to it, draw this very pictorially, we started at a, we hit the line, we go horizontally, we go vertically again to hit the line y equals fx. Now again, if we go horizontally until we hit y equals x, this will be the line, uh, this will be the value f of f of a, right? So if we go vertically to the y equals x line, we'll get uh, 3 times the f of a. So we can see by this pictorial depiction that if the curve is shaped this way, uh, we will eventually converge to the intersection point. So the f of f of f infinitely many of times of a will converge to this intersection point. So this is actually how to think about the long-term behavior of nested function. Now, of course, this particular uh, diagram is only possible because I intentionally draw y equals fx to have this uh, concave shape. So depending on whether it's concave, convex, or so on, you will get different behavior. So I encourage uh, anyone who is seeing this for the first time to read a bit more about this in a, a calculus book, for example. But anyway, back to the main problem. We've seen how to reason about this for a general f. and Fortunately for our function, uh, y equals sine of pi was 3x. The graph actually looks something similar. So uh, if this is x and I draw y equals pi over 3x, you actually get a graph like this. And uh, y equals x, it looks something like this. You can very quickly check by calculating the derivative at 0, for example. The y equals x line will lie below first, then you'll cut, cut it again. So, uh, and this is the point three. So using a similar method, you can see that regardless of which x you start with, right, uh, whether it's below the intersection point or, or to the right of the intersection point, the long-term behavior will eventually converge to the intersection point. So basically what this means is that the limit uh, of n to infinity of all these uh, nested signs, which I am frankly quite lazy to write out, but something like this, sine pi over 3x. This limit is given by the intersection point A, where A is the intersection point, right? So A satisfy sine pi over 3a equals A. And you can very quickly check that A equals half is the solution uh, because sine pi over 6 is indeed half. So a equals half satisfies the solution. So the integral is actually really a really trivial integral. 
uh, the the answer is uh I just shortcut uh, right the answer is equal to the integral from zero to three of half dx which is three over two. So the hard part of this problem is not the integral but a test of your understanding of how to look at uh nested functions taken to the limit. Yeah, so that's all for problem 11. Hope you find the ideas interesting. Now let's look at some real integrals. Okay, if you'd like to give a go for this problem, feel free to pause the video. Okay, this is a classic integration problem where the substitution is actually quite classic. So, uh, if you have something like 1 minus u square, you usually substitute say u equals sine theta because then you get 1 minus sine square theta which is cosine square theta and then you square that you get very simple cosine theta. So naturally what you will want to try for this case because now you have a square root x, you will want to let x equals sine to the 4 theta so that you get 1 minus sine square inside and you square root that you get cosine which is very simple. But before that we let us calculate so dx is 4 sine cube theta cosine theta d theta. So as I mentioned the integral becomes 0. Uh, integrate sorry not uh, from 0 because sine 0 is 0 and then sine pi over 2 is 1 so this pi over 2 and as I mentioned, you get square root of 1 minus sine square, right? So you get uh, cosine theta here, and then you get 4 sine cube theta cosine theta d theta. Okay, so there are many ways to proceed from here. I think they are all a bit tedious, but what I will do, the method I will choose, right, is... I will uh, combine the cos square sine square into sine 2 theta. So I use the double angle formula. So specifically, uh, I combine 4 sine square theta, cos square theta, and this is sine theta, d theta, and I replace this as sine 2 theta squared using the double angle formula. And then sine 2 theta squared, I can write this as using the uh, cosine double angle, right? Cosine double angle tells us that uh, cosine 4 theta would have been 1 minus 2 sine square 2 theta, right? So using the double angle formula yet again, uh, this will give us 1 minus cos 4 theta over 2. So what does this give? The whole integral is the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of, firstly you have half sine theta, right, and then you have uh, minus half uh, cosine 4 theta sine theta d theta okay and then now uh, I think this should be quite classic uh, trigger uh, that needs to be integrated the way to do it is we will use the sum to product or product to sum formula uh, basically, to recap, you have sine A minus sine B equals 2 cos A plus B over 2 sine A minus B over 2. So what this means is that this part, the this product part, right, if you reverse it, is actually uh, half sine phi theta minus sine 3 theta. 
Okay, so the integral is equal 0 pi over 2. You have half sine theta. And then you have minus 1 quarter sine phi theta. And then you have plus 1 quarter sine 3 theta d theta. So finally, this is something that can be directly integrated. Uh, you have minus half cosine theta plus 120 cosine phi theta minus 112 cosine 3 theta evaluated from 0 to pi over 2. And cosine of 0 is uh, 1 but cosine of pi over 2 is 0, right? So the cosine of pi over 2 part when you suck in, uh, these are all odd multiples of pi over 2. So when you suck in pi over 2, you get a whole bunch of 0. Whereas when you suck in theta equals 0, uh, so you get 0 minus, right? You suck in 0, you get minus half plus 120 minus 112. Because they are all cosine 0, so it's 1. Right, so you can just uh, calculate this fraction. Uh, this is half minus 120 uh, plus 112, which you can convert to common denominator of 60. Get 30 minus 3 uh, plus, uh, plus 5. So this is 32 over 60. Which you can simplify as 8 over 15. So this is problem number 12 for you. It's combination of classic trigo sub with like classic trigo manipulation. So a really involved problem. I hope you enjoy that. Okay, let us take a look at problem 13. This one is really interesting. So we like to give it a go. Feel free to pause the video. Okay, so this problem actually is about observation. Uh, what you might realize is that if you differentiate this last term, you end up with this term. If you differentiate this term, you end up with this term. And if you differentiate x, you end up with 1. So quite an interesting starting uh, observation. Will that help you to solve the problem? Possibly, but... Let me present the problem in a way that makes it even more obvious. So what we'll do is this integral. Let me first pull out a copy of 6 so that I get uh, x cubed over 6 on top. Okay, so I don't seem to have made much progress. But now instead of keeping x cubed over 6, let me write this as 1 minus the other terms. So 1 minus this. Right, so this is uh, 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 6. So now that I've written it in this form, the earlier observation comes in useful because if I differentiate the bottom, I get the numerator because I differentiate the last term, I get this, this term. I differentiate the x squared over 2, I get x. I differentiate the x, I get 1. I differentiate 1, it gets nothing. So actually, the numerator is a derivative of the denominator. So this is really literally just x minus the natural log of the denominator. Yeah, so and plus c. So that is all for question 13. Yeah, it relies on this astute observation. So I hope you will enjoy that. Then I'll take a look at question 14. If you'd like to give it a go, feel free to pause the video. Okay, so you see some uh, really interesting nested signs, but this question is simpler than uh, it looks. And the key trick is to again use the sum to product formula that we already saw earlier, sine A minus sine B equals 
2 cosine a plus b over 2 sine a minus b over 2. And why will you be prompted to do this? It's quite simple. If you combine the terms inside, you get very simple uh, single uh, trigo terms. So specifically, if I apply the formula, this becomes the integral of 2 cosine. The sum of the things inside is literally just x, right? The sines cancel. So it's the sum of the inside divided by 2 is just x. And then the sine of the difference of the terms inside divided by 2, which is also is just the single term sine x. So I need to integrate this. Now it looks like uh, this is a terrible situation to be in because we have nested sine. Hey, but actually cosine is the derivative of sine. So literally, this is just sine square of sine x. Because if you apply the chain rule, you bring down the power of 2, uh, or rather, apologies, uh, yes, if you use chain rule, you bring down the power of 2, you get this term, and then you differentiate the inside, which will give you the cosine x. So this is really just the answer. So a very sharp observation needed, and voila, the problem is solved. Uh, now the answer given here is a constant away from the official answer, so it's still correct because the answer can differ by a, a fixed constant. Yeah, so just take note of that if you are looking at the official answer. Okay. Now let us take a look at problem 15. I'd like to give it a go. Please feel free to pause the video. Okay, this problem looks complicated. Uh, the truth is the way I solve this problem involves uh, another astute observation. So unfortunately, it's very hard to motivate how to see the solution, but uh, it comes down to an astute observation. And the way I reach the observation is that I notice that there's a whole bunch of secant and tangent, right? And one term has more secant than other, and the other term has more tangent than the first one, right? And this looks like it could be due to a product formula where you, you lose secant after differentiating one side, and then you lose tangent after differentiating the other side. So this prompts me to investigate. Uh, the ratio of tangent is secant square, and the derivative of secant is secant tangent. So this lends further possibility that uh, this is some product rule thing where secant and tangent are just thrown out of the re result of product rule. So specifically, I want to backwards construct a product where I have tangent x and secant x, and then if I differentiate, I get some tangent sec power secant power plus some tangent power secant power, right? And what's the right power to use? Now, this term looks like, the first term looks like it uh, has lost secant and gained tangent in the process. So what I suspect is that it started off uh, at Secant cube, because when you differentiate secant, you get a secant and a tangent, and this looks like it will be a cube. So indeed, you can just try and reverse engineer to get the power here, and then you can check that d dx of uh, tangent cube, secant cube. Indeed, if you use the product rule, if you first differentiate the tangent part, right, you get 3, you lose a tangent, but you generate 2 copies of secant, so you get secant 5. Plus, if you differentiate the secant, you get, uh, you, you get a copy of tangent, and you don't lose any secant because you regenerate the secant. So, by reverse engineering, you will observe that yes, this uh, this product rule will give you the close to your desired answer, and the answer is really just one third of that. So the answer by reverse engineering is one third of tangent cube x, secant cube x, plus c. So unfortunately, I can't give a more compelling way to reach the answer, but this is as close as how I uh, actually derive it on my own. So hope you still manage to uh, find some uh, credence to this approach. And yeah, try to derive the cube yourself, and you will see why this is a reasonable guess. Okay. 
on to question 16. If you'd like to give this a go, please feel free to pause the video. Okay, so this is actually a sort of like an extended version of the classic uh, integrate log x uh, problem. So what you, you see so many logs, right? I think what you might want to do is use integration by parts. And first thing you will try to write down is that everyone knows the favorite old trick of uh, integrate log x is x log x minus x, right? And so uh, this suggests to you that actually, uh, I mean, you can also very quickly check if you move the x across, uh, basically, uh, the integral of 1 plus log x is just x log x. Yeah, or you can just use the product rule to check that uh, when you differentiate x log x, you get 1 plus log x. Uh. So this is a very useful thing to write down as, at the start. And once you write this down, it should prompt you that, oh, actually using integration by parts is not a bad idea after all. So the integral we want, if we use integration by parts, is uh, first we integrate the thing in the bracket and we get x log x. And then, of course, we have uh, log log x, then minus. Uh, we keep the thing in the bracket, but we differentiate the thing in the outside of the bracket. The log log x becomes uh differentiate log x over log x and hey this whole thing cancels and becomes one so this is really just x log x log log x minus x plus c so that is all again a question that involves a astute observation and voila so hope you found the motivation useful uh certainly I think writing down the integral of log x will go a long way to help you get started. Okay, question 17 looks like a monster. Uh, if you'd like to give it a go, feel free to pause the video. Okay, so actually this question is a lot easier than it seems. Uh, because if you think about it, there must be some pattern to having all the trigo functions around, right? So there must be some way to pair them. And since we have a trigo and its derivative version, uh, each trigo is, has its, der uh, not derivative, but reciprocal version, uh, included, right? You might want to pair them up. So first you investigate. Okay. If I have a number A and then I have one plus its reciprocal like this, what do you get? Do you get a pattern? And indeed, yes, if you combine the fraction, you get 1 plus 1 over a plus 1 plus a over 1 plus, uh, now you multiply out the denominator, you get, you get this. So actually, the sum of the two terms is always equal to 1. Ah, so actually the integral is really easy. You pair up each trigo with its, uh, reciprocal. And you get three copies of that, right? So the answer is literally just integral 3 dx, which is 3x plus c. Yeah, so that's all. Uh, comes down again to an uh, astute observation, since that I have been saying it for like most questions in the second half. Yeah, but really this one is, uh, there's, there's no further tricks to it. Ah, uh, okay, let us take a look at question 18. If you'd like to uh, give it a go, feel free to pause the video. Okay, so this is another classic substitution problem. Uh, to see the substitution, let us first write the integral with the square root x pulled out. So now you have this. And the thing is square root x and square root 1 minus x looks like it's pretty different from each other. So this is the annoying part. So you will want to sort of shift your coordinate uh, so that you introduce some symmetry. And specifically, what we're going to do is we are going to let x equals half plus y. And you'll see why this introduces symmetry to the problem. So dx equals dy. Now if we sub in x equals half plus y, 
this becomes half plus y, and the other term becomes half minus y. So, and this is just dy. And indeed, you see, by centralizing the coordinate to half, you get a half plus y, half minus y, which allows you to combine the square roots into one quarter minus y square. Ah, and now this is something that you can integrate because if you take out the square root 4 part, you get 2 over square root 1 minus 4y square dy. And now this is a, a classic uh, antiderivative where you need to recall that if you differentiate uh, sine inverse or, or arc sine, x you get 1 over square root 1 minus x square right so that means this integral is given by sine inverse of 2y uh, because first you differentiate normally you get 1 over square root of 1 minus 4y square right and then you differentiate inside by chain rule so you get a factor of 2 appearing so it's just this and of course now we substitute back y equals to x minus half so this gives you uh, 2x minus 1 right because y equals to x minus half yes so that is uh, all to this problem again it differs from the official answer by a constant uh, number so this is uh, also a perfectly valid answer. Okay, let us take a look at question 19. Uh, if you'd like to give it a go, feel free to pause the video. Okay, so this looks really complicated, but it's a really nice problem as well. Uh, what you would need to do is, let us take a look at the infinite sum and see what we can do about it. So. The infinite sum, I mean, firstly, we can uh, write this uh, binomial coefficient as m plus 3, choose 3 instead. Right, and if we do this, uh, we get basically by literal definition is m plus 3, choose 2, m plus, sorry, m plus 3, m plus 2, m plus 1 over. 3 factorial which is 6 right x to the n right uh, and then so if we integrate this assuming you can integrate term by term which is something you don't need to care for such contest uh, the m plus 1 get absorbed into the power right so if you integrate uh, term by term this becomes uh, m plus 3 m plus 2 over 6 x to the m plus 1 okay plus c and this is a classic infinite power series thing okay so rather than writing the plus c i'm just going to use use the definite integral so uh so this from zero to half and so i get this thing that i need to evaluate at uh, from 0 to half and of course when x equals 0 I get 0 right so I just need to uh, find it the value of this expression when x equals to half okay that's all I need to do now how do I find the sum of this infinite series when x equals to half this is a classic uh, another classic problem actually where what you need to do right is you need to investigate the this series fx so let us do a sketch hit corner here if you let fx equals to so let fx equals to the sum xn plus 3 right so if we differentiate one time you get the sum where the n plus 3 comes down and get xn plus 2 and if you differentiate again so f prime prime x, you get the n plus 2 coming down, 
and this is x n plus one, which is sort of uh what we want. So this sum right is actually equals to one six of f prime prime evaluated at half. Of course, it sounds like we haven't really solved the problem because f itself is another infinite series. But the nice thing is this infinite series f has a closed form expression. It can be written as 1 over 1 minus x. But uh, this infinite series starts at 1, is 1 plus x plus x squared plus x squared and so on, right? Whereas the f only starts at x cubed. So you know, minus 1 minus x minus x squared. Okay, so that means actually you can evaluate f prime in closed form also. f prime is just 1 over 1 minus x squared minus 1 minus 2x. And again, you can evaluate f prime prime in closed form. By differentiating the closed form above, you get 2 over 1 minus x cubed minus 2. So f prime prime half. Uh, and one six of that, right, is one six of two over half cubed minus two, which is fourteen over six, which is seven over three. So, a really cool problem that uses the classic method of uh, writing an infinite series in closed form and then differentiating it to find the derivative of uh, another series. Yeah. So hopefully you enjoyed this refresher. And on to the last problem, which is uh, something you want to definitely give it a shot. So feel free to pause the video. Okay, this problem is yet another classic integral. There's definitely tons of videos on YouTube. Uh, this is a substitution problem where the substitution is not so apparent at first. But if you divide the top and bottom by cosine square, you'll get secant square over secant square plus 1. And now the substitution is slightly more suggested in this form because recall that if we differentiate tangent x, we get secant square x. Right, so secant square x dx sounds like we can use a substitution u equals uh, tangent x. And at the same time, secant square in the bottom plus 1 reminds of the trigger identity uh, tangent square x plus 1 equals secant square x. So there's hope that actually doing something about tangent x will give you the answer. So indeed, what we're going to do is let u equals to tangent x. So the u equals secant square x dx. So the top takes care of itself. The top is the whole thing in the numerator becomes just du. And the denominator Using the trigger identity gives you 2 plus tangent square x, right? So 2 plus u square. And this is a, a integral that can be directly integrated because uh, there is a formula that integral of 1 over x squared plus a squared dx is actually equal to 1 over a uh, up tangent x over a. So this is a known formula, which means that this integral is directly going to give you 1 over square root 2 up tangent u over square root 2. And substituting back uh, u as tangent x, this gives you 1 over square root 2 up tangent tangent x.
over square root 2 plus c. So that's all to the last problem of the MIT integration B2022 qualifying round. Hope you enjoyed this entire series. Certainly there are some interesting integrals. Stay tuned to the channel for more math videos and see you soon.